Thanks for joining the show today. I say it every time I see him and every time I introduce him on the show, he's been on a time or two. His name is Dr. David Nodder, and he is one of my top favorite humans on the planet. He changed my pace of survivorship from cancer when I moved here. And I always enjoy getting to see him and know that he's doing well after he's helped so many people in this community and throughout the country get well as well. <laughs> That's a lot of well. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I feel like um, I don't even know where to get started with you sometimes. A lot of times I just want to know how you are and what you've been up to. You're a retired physician from right here in the Wenatchee Valley. And what year did you retire? Well, 2010. I kind of flunked retirement a number of times, but that was uh, the official retirement it was 2010. And then, uh, well, I kind of slid back into a couple of things and uh, was one of the uh, hospice uh, co-directors for a while when they had a staffing problem that was acute and they would have shut down the program actually statutorily without a director. The previous director had their family reasons, had to go back to Montana. And so uh, uh, three of us retired docs, this is back in mm, about 2014, 15. Um, it's a part-time job and we figured four Four of us doctors could do a part-time job altogether. We were, I mean, that's not too hard, right? Uh, well, it can be hard, but it was wonderful, and uh, I loved it. So I did that until mm, about uh, late 2017, and I worked in Alaska for mm, about seven years on and off for some friends uh, who were uh, needing coverage if they were at a meeting or something and uh, in Anchorage, uh, which I absolutely loved doing. Uh, but I had to stop that also in 2017 because I got, you know, five grandkids. Now I got six. And that's, I mean, that's the priority. You should be there. And yeah, so, I missed an opportunity there. I've often thought I would have loved to have gone to visit you in Anchorage and show that part of your story. But uh, I was too late to the Don't Wait Story Tours. To, oh, I see. To Alaska. Alaska's wonderful. I love Alaska. I mean, Alaska's full of paradoxes and... Uh, and some degree of hypocrisy, like a lot of places. But so what? Uh, way deeper than that are these these Alaskan uh, natives. Uh, when you walk in, I mean, uh, people who live in Alaska and also Alaska uh, natives, both uh, groups of people, they're just amazingly engaged with the moment. I mean, it's striking. And it makes you want to give everything you possibly can the minute you walk in, because they're usually very sick. No one goes to the doctor in Alaska unless they're oh. sicker than anybody else can imagine. You have to. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a, that's a thing that I, you know, I've never been to Alaska or any really place like it. Um, and I don't know if there is a place like it, but somewhere that's remote like that where, where they're not maybe getting the care that they need all along. Uh, and there are people in very, in other parts of the country who don't go to the doctor <laughs> until they're very sick, even though they have the resources, right? No kidding. That's you right. All sides of that. I think it's actually hard to go to the doctor because there are a lot of impediments to going to the doctor, not just financial, not just health insurance. That's a major one. But, you know, going to the doctor is not a pleasant trip, usually, when you're sick. You know, I've got white coat uh, syndrome, they call it. My blood pressure is never <laughs> under. Sometimes it's like literally 140 over 100 or something. It's just as soon as I walk in the door. So my physician now, she'll say, take your blood pressure, like, in the morning before you come. and it's always good. And then I get in there. I went in for my annual checkup that I do. I should mention that you were my follow-up oncologist, but we'll get into that. And I go to my checkup every year and, and I don't like it, uh, but I go. And uh, I go to the uh, oncology unit to get my IV for my MRI because my veins aren't that great and it's kind of hard to get a good stick. And for the first time, they were taking my blood pressure and you know temperature and all of that. And I'm like, you're going to take my blood pressure in an oncology unit and expect, and it was literally like, she goes, so you, you know that it's supposed to be high. I said, yeah, it's, it, I'm good. It's okay. I took it this morning. So it is a very stressful thing for someone who's never had illness and someone who, who has had their share, whether it's for themselves or their family members. And, um, but walking into your office, Dr. Nodder, was always um, this extra layer of uh, comfort, and I want to I want to talk about that and how you approached patient care 
uh, you chose a field in oncology that's got to be one of the toughest uh, to work in, but yet sometimes one of the most rewarding. You get patients who are who are alive for a long time to tell about it. So let's take a break and then let's start to dive into what the work you did, how it shaped you, how it's made you, and how it's impacted you even now in retirement. That's good. We'll do that. Okay. We'll be back in just a moment. We're talking with Dr. David Nodder. He is my guest today. I didn't mention in the first segment, or I didn't make it clear, that you were my physician when I moved here from Texas. And uh, so I was seen it in I was seen in Northern California where I was diagnosed, and then I did my follow up when I moved back to Houston. We were just in California during my treatment because I was diagnosed at Christmas time when visiting my family. Oh, I see. And so my family physician diagnosed me. Uh, who de- he delivered me as a baby, and he was the one who, wow. uh, who told our family that I had cancer. And so we chose to stay in Northern California because the protocol for Hodgkin's disease was pretty universal, um, and being home was important. Yes. So then when we moved back to Texas, my follow-up was at MD Anderson, which was very difficult, much different than a family physician checking in on you every couple of weeks to okay. your oncologist. So then when I moved to Washington, it was time for my checkup, and I thought, what am I going to do now? This is just, I'm starting all over again with these strangers. And one of my dear friends, her dad had had you as a doctor when he was going through uh, lymphoma, and they recommended you. And my very first visit with you, I don't know if you remember this, but uh, Hunter was five, and he's now going to be 22. And Wesley had only died maybe, uh, you know, within less than t- 10 months or so, a year. And uh, I was, I said to you, you know, we got to figure out how to make sure I get to live a long life. We've got to, can't, you know, my son, my son can't become an orphan. And right. you said, how long have you been well? I see your chart, it's eight years. And I said, yeah, and he goes, I, you said, you're cured. And I said, I, I don't know what it was about your faith in my ability to live but you helped me believe in it and it absolutely changed my pace changed my whole life well you know uh the what you learn in medicine is that the patients over time the patients teach you they tell you what they need they tell you how to be a better doctor they tell you how to comfort and how to talk with them and how to heal them even if they aren't cured right healing and curing quite different of course (laughs) um anybody can be healed be made less broken be made more whole that's my sense of that word here for this talk i mean you can talk about healing in different ways of course but that's what i think is highly useful every patient needs healing every time that patient, whether in remission, whether in relapse, whether healthy, whether dying, every patient needs healing every visit. And every patient can be healed to an extent every visit. They can't be put into remission every visit. That's a whole different deal, that's science. Technology, scans, um, treatments, all kinds of things. And that's of course the focus of medicine, but it's not the only focus. Well, and that's what I think you understood better than I understood it myself. You know, I was a babe in the woods, even at eight years. I I still felt, the the moment that I found out I was pregnant with Hunter, and I mean the moment that I looked at the stick, you know, they told us to wait at least a year to try to have a baby and two would be better because the threat of recurrence was so drastically reduced. So, you know me, I'm compliant. We waited till two years to the month and found out three weeks later I was pregnant, which was really miraculous in itself because of the risk of infertility and things from the treatment I chose and that was protocol that I committed to. And um, I remember the moment I found out I was pregnant, I thought, I can't be the mom I know I want to be and live in this constant fear. Because I was still checking for lumps and still very, just very uncomfortable in my own skin. And so I, 
I just made a decision in that moment. Like it, I just had, I had to feel healed. I had to feel like uh, uh, the same body that had survived cancer had now created this miraculous human life. And I had to respect that. And that's what I chose moving forward. But it didn't mean that doctor's appointments weren't stressful right. and that CT scans searching for cancer weren't stressful and blood work still isn't stressful. Uh, but walking into your office, and I've talked to so many people you've treated and cared for over the years and helped heal, um, however you use the term, that felt the same way. And I don't know. I wonder, do you become a doctor be of, the, of oncology or in your field and the type of doctor you were because it's who you were already? Or do you become a doctor and then listen so intently to your patients over, to, over the years that that makes you the doctor you are? Which, which comes first? Well, that's a great question. Uh, it's uh, probably not answerable, but it, it needs discussion. And what I think is, I think, to go into medicine, you don't need a large number of personal traits, but you need empathy. You must have empathy. You must know how to and want to engage with people. And you must have learned that before you're an adolescent, for sure, usually as a baby or growing up. Um, I learned it from my mother. My dad was uh, dead when I was six. He died suddenly. And so uh, I have my mom uh, and my brother and sister, but I learned it from them uh, somehow. I, mean, I don't know exactly where it came from, but that's, that's highly important. That's a prerequisite. If you're not empathetic, you don't belong in medicine. And, and almost everybody in medicine is empathetic. There maybe are some exceptions. Yes, that's true, but not very many of them. And hopefully they aren't in clinical medicine. Hopefully they're in the lab somewhere. Well, and that's one of the conversation I, I get called a lot over the years. I'm I still do receive calls from people who want to know about how to advocate for themselves, especially how to advocate for a loved one. And they're not happy with the care. Or this doctor isn't following up or this nurse isn't doing her part of it. And I'm like, get a new doctor. I mean, you just can't go through a health crisis. Now, communicate first you know, try to get your needs met. But if there's some really, like in my mother's case, falling through the cracks to the point of almost costing her her life, get a new doctor. And a lot of people don't understand that that is an option. You know, if there's a part of care that you need, um, that in fact, one of the doctors that you're describing ends up in clinical medicine instead of a lab, you know, and, and then a lot of it's personalities, right? I think um, I have a friend who recently shared with me that she has some issues and wasn't being heard by her doctor. And she's a young woman, hasn't had children yet or anything. And I said, you know what? You're so young. Go find the doctor that you want to grow old with, who you want to, <laughs> yeah, really? you want to have, you know, she may not be your OB, but she'll be the person that's part of your pregnancy and growing your family. And, and, and so find that now while you're young and just follow your gut about that. It doesn't mean it has to be this upheaval, she's fired somebody. Um, it's just a shift in where you're, you know, making that choice. Have, have there been people that you've felt like you've helped in that way to receive them differently than they had been received before? Yes, that's right. And, and, and I'm, I'm sure there may be some that uh, wanted a different doctor uh, from me. Well, that's uh, understandable and funny. I, I mean, it's, it's almost a requirement that a patient have a physician or a group of physicians, all of which are inspirational to the patient and the patient inspirational to all of the doctors. And then the dynamic of medicine, which is actually pure, can be expressed. And that pure dynamic is basically a love dynamic and a commitment. The dynamic is basically perfect in medicine. Now that the circumstances are often highly tragic, but the dynamic is perfect, and that is the doctor and the patient, ideally, and most of the time it, it is an, an ideal that is met, want exactly the same thing, and they want it intensely. There's exact deep agreement on the mission and the goal and the process. I mean, that's idealistically speaking, but it's true. 
um, most of the time, it is true. Um, that's the attraction, part of the attraction of medicine is that incredible dynamic between a person who comes into your office and the team of physicians and nurses who meets and engages with that person. It's absolutely amazing. When I, when I applied to medical school, you know, you, you write, of course, uh, everybody does because everybody is asked the same question. So why do you want to be a doctor anyway? I mean, it's an obvious question. And the answer actually is almost always stereotypic, not because you think they want to hear it, but because it's almost always true. And that is said in one sentence, uh, you have to love the application of science to human suffering. But beyond that, you're, you, you don't know yet when you're applying to medical school, the extent to which the patients will teach you another dimension, which is relational dimension with people who are ill that you are helping as they help you, unknowing to them. They don't know they're helping you. They don't know they're teaching you. And they never do, but they do. They taught me all kinds of things my patients did over the years. I was a much better doctor at the end of my career than I was at the beginning. And that's not because of knowledge. I mean, you read and you understand, yes, okay. But really it's because of relational uh, knowledge. Basically, the patients taught me that you have to look at them in the eye. You have to listen to them as they talk and you have to touch them. Touching is physical diagnosis, it's essential. But there is also something called the, the healing touch, which was true long before anybody knew much about physical diagnosis. It was true hundreds of years ago in, in medical practitioners. There is an energy and a force and a beauty and a power in touching. If you go to a doctor and the doctor does not examine you, which happened to a friend of mine who was quite ill with melanoma, as well, yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, does not examine you. I mean, maybe you don't have to have be examined every time you come in. Okay. I mean, exams are for a reason. You, you don't examine for no reason. You examine, is the liver bigger? Is there a lymph node here? Is the lung filled up with fluid? 100, 150 things you're doing at this. And you tell the patient what you're doing so they understand what you're doing. Right. Well, that's, that's, that's powerful relationship. And as you do that, you're talking to the patient, looking at the patient in the eye. The patient is looking back at you. And I mean, you learn, you learn by the primary senses, those three, seeing, watching actually. So watching, hearing, touching, those are the primary senses. So uh, if you don't do that, if you're all screen limited, the screens are important, data is important, scans are important, all that stuff's important. If, if you don't actually use those senses, the patient is not getting what he or she deserves. You are not getting the information. There is no healing. There might be some medical progress. Yes, it's not exactly uh, devoid of progress, but it's the opposite of satisfactory medicine. It, it, let's, I wanna talk to you about the flip side of that and the patient's responsibility. Uh, in, in when they visit their physician and what, what it is that they could expect, but also it, their responsibility. So let's take a quick break and when we come back, we'll talk more with Dr. Nodder. So let's just plan on this being a two-part show, okay? Okay. I got more I want to ask you. Okay. okay. We'll be back in just a moment. We're back with uh, uh, Dr. David Nodder. We've already decided, right, that we're gonna make this a uh, two, two episode show uh, because I still have a lot of, uh, that I wanted to ask you about today's times and, and your view from an outsider, retired physician looking in through a different lens. Um, I, we talked in the earlier segment about the doctor's responsibility to be part of you know, touching, listening, paying attention and hearing the patient. I think sometimes uh, you mentioned that you know when you're examining a part of body, the body, explain to them why they're doing it. When um, let them start to understand this whole exam and what it means, because sometimes for some patients like myself, we're going to go through it the rest of our lives. Uh, 
I hear so often someone will say, well, yeah, I, I have high blood pressure. Well, what's your blood pressure? They don't know. Or I have high cholesterol. I'm taking such and such medication. What's your cholesterol? They don't know. Um, I feel like there's like this, I, when I was going through treatment, there was a blue card when I was going through chemotherapy. And on the front of the blue card was every crummy thing that's probably going to happen to your body that you're going to feel that's completely normal and it's okay. And on the back of the blue card was this stuff's more serious, might require a hospital emergency, contact your physician right away. Well, I know myself as a patient. And if I saw the back of the blue card, I'd probably start thinking myself into some of that stuff. So Wesley, my late husband, and my mom knew what was on the back of that blue card. And if I started to have something outside of what seemed normal, then, you know, like a fever that's prolonged, you know, any of these things that go on. And um, so that worked for me. But it didn't mean that I was ignorant to the treatment that I'd chosen, the side effects, the long-term responsibilities. It just meant that that was the part I knew myself as a patient, what I, what I didn't want running around in this already complicated thought process of mine. Do you feel like the experience with a patient who, you know, at the beginning of a cancer diagnosis, I was 24 years old. Wesley was sick when I was 31. He died when I was 32. My mom was sick in my mid forties. So three decades of my life, were met with horrific uh, medical experiences. But if I hadn't learned from the beginning of my own journey to when my family literally helped save my mother's life with our, our advocacy, do you feel like there's some patients that come in and expect too much from their doctor and not take on some of what it is to be human, to take care of ourselves and know ourselves? Absolutely, that, that that is true, and and it's a big problem. I mean, to to have engagement, it has to be mutual, and the mutuality of it uh, presupposes uh, a degree of uh, commitment, knowledge, fortitude, effort on the part of the patient. Uh, the problem is that the patient, um, stereotypically speaking, you know, that the patient coming in for the first time or the first few times feels completely vulnerable, completely naked, completely powerless, completely at the effect of the situation and, and, and the people in that situation, the caregivers, me, the nurses, everybody. Uh, so it's very hard for the patient in that setting, unless they happen to be uh, strong-willed or self-advocating by, by character, which uh, is good, but isn't so common, uh, except for that, it's very hard for the patient to do his or her part. So, and, and it's even harder nowadays, actually. It should be easier with, you know, you'd think that over time it would get easier with medicine. Medicine should be smarter. Medicine should uh, bring the patient in uh, and, and more than it, it has in the past. That does happen in the chemotherapy room because the chemotherapy nurses, during the times of their infusions, which take you know, it can take an hour, can take two hours, can take more than a few minutes for sure. Yeah. yeah. And have conversations with those patients. And they are they are teaching every time they give the infusion. They're they're actually teachers, of course. Yeah. I mean they're skilled. So Guess they're, what? We're already out of time. Oh sorry. <laughs> sorry. Oh, no, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna end the show and we're gonna come back when people see you next <laughs> week and they can watch them together when they watch them again. Okay. We're going to be back with Dr. Nodder next week, but really in just a minute. Do you want to become part of the most dependable brand of vehicles today? Then start looking at Town Toyota. Come drive the best-selling, totally redesigned 2019 RAV4. Come check out the powerful towing performance of the Tundra. It's built for the work site and the weekend. Forge your own path and seek tougher roads in the Tacoma. Leave no trail left unchallenged. Whatever your vehicle needs, Toyota has a seat for you. Come visit us today.